Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Public Library's virtual presentation. Uh, today, I would like to welcome Professor Carl Robert Keyes, Professor of History at Assumption University. Professor Keyes directs and publishes two digital humanities projects devoted to the history of advertising. Today, he's going to talk about one of them the Slavery Adverts 250 project, where he republishes every advertisement for slaves published in colonial American newspapers 250 years ago that day. Over to you, Professor Keyes. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen really quickly so that you can see the visual images. So please bear with me for just a moment. Okay, so thank you Priya for this invitation and to the Shrewsbury Public Library for hosting your social justice series this fall. And many thanks to everybody in the audience, whether you're joining via Zoom or via Facebook Live or other means of participating in tonight's presentation. Uh, I'm going to spend the next hour or so sharing with you about the Slavery Adverts 250 project. I'd like to start by providing an overview of the project and then telling you some about what we learn about enslaved people from the advertisements that are included in the project. If time permits, I'd also like to share with you how the general public has engaged with the project, uh, but that might be something that we have to cover during the question and answer period because I'm going to try to be conscious of how much time we have together as well. So the Slavery Adverts 250 project is a public history and digital humanities project that identifies, remediates, and republishes advertisements about enslaved men, women, and children that were originally published in American newspapers 250 years ago to the day. It's currently chronicling advertisements from the year 1770, placing the project in the era of the American Revolution. And the advertisements that are included in the project fall into four main categories. Enslaved people for sale is the first one. Enslaved people wanted either for purchase or to hire, or what we would call renting today is the second. Enslaved people who liberated themselves, the so-called runaway slave advertisements are the third category. And enslaved people who escaped bondage but were captured form the fourth category. And that's divided into two subcategories, brought to the workhouse in the Southern colonies or committed to jail in the Northern colonies, a real 18th century precursor to the prison industrial complex that houses so many black men and women, especially black men today. And so this is, uh, these advertisements are distributed via a, a Twitter feed and you'll get to see more of that in a moment. I'd like to, before I go further, acknowledge the sources of the images of newspaper advertisements that appear in this presentation. Uh, I work with, and my students also work with, a series of databases of digitized images of 18th century newspapers. So anything you see from a newspaper published in Maryland comes from the Archives of Maryland online. Newspapers from Virginia come from Colonial Williamsburg's digital library. Newspapers from South Carolina come from accessible archives, and then all other newspapers come from Redex News Bank's America's Historical Newspapers series. Archives of, Mar uh, uh, archives of Maryland Online and Colonial Williamsburg are both uh, free on the web to anybody with an internet connection. The other two databases, however, require a subscription uh, and are mostly uh, accessible to, to scholars and to research institutions. So this project recently marked its fourth anniversary in September. And in the past four years, it's featured more than 13,800 advertisements concerning enslaved men, women, and children. And the project uses Twitter to disseminate those advertisements, seeking to recreate for a 21st century social media using audience an experience similar to what Americans in the 18th century experienced 
when they engaged with the most common form of media of that era, the newspaper. There were no classifieds or organization to early American newspapers. Instead, advertisements were not uh, classified by category, uh, and they were not confined to certain spaces in the newspaper. They could appear on the first, the last, or any middle pages of the newspaper, uh, often alongside uh, the, the, the news. So that meant that anybody who was perusing a newspaper might suddenly encounter uh, an advertisement about enslaved men, women, or children when they weren't necessarily expecting to. The same way that modern users, as they're scrolling through their Twitter feeds, are going to encounter uh, advertisements from the Slavery Adverts 250 project, perhaps when they're not expecting to encounter them. Now, in addition to this Twitter feed, which can be very ephemeral, once a tweet goes out, uh, it scrolls down the page and, and can be lost pretty easily. So in addition to the Twitter feed, uh, I also keep a daily digest on the Adverts 250 Project's website so that scholars, students, and the general public can go back and can investigate the advertisements in greater detail at their leisure and can find them more easily than trying to scroll back through a Twitter feed. This project was inspired in part by David Waldstriker's article from 1999 in the William and Mary Quarterly, one of the flagship journals for early American history, called Reading the Runaways, Self-Fashioning, Print Culture, and Confidence in Slavery in the 18th Century Mid-Atlantic. And Waldstriker went through and he looked at advertisements for enslaved people who liberated themselves, those so-called runaway slave advertisements, uh, in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. And he had certain conclusions that he reached about them. And I wanted to test those conclusions about whether or not they applied throughout the, the colonies uh, from New England all the way to Georgia. So I inaugurated this project initially as a 10-week experimental assignment in my Colonial America class in the fall of 2016. But it was so well received that the project has been in continuous production since then, that I kept it going over the winter break and then continued it with my Revolutionary America class in the, the spring semester, and then have continued it either on my own or in collaboration with students during semesters and vacations uh, since then. I wanted my students to en engage with the advertisements and to see them in context. So as they're going through uh, and doing the research, they are using uh, the, the databases of the 18th century uh, newspapers. Uh, they are engaging with the full pages of the newspapers and not just the advertisements that they are extracting for public consumption via the project. Uh, in the past four years, the project has gained uh, just shy of 7,000 followers, and I've incorporated it into a variety of courses that I teach at Assumption University. Colonial America, Revolutionary America, Slavery and Freedom in America, Introduction to Public History, and Research Methods, Vast Early America are all courses in which students have become guest curators for the Slavery Adverts 250 project. Now, each one of the tweets, as you can see, has several standard components. Each one includes a tagline that explains one of the purposes of the project, that colonial newspapers contributed to the perpetuation of slavery. Each one includes a quotation from the advertisement. Each one includes a citation, the name of the newspaper and the date. And each includes an image of the advertisement and I've recently uh, created a Twitter bot that works with another Twitter bot that does OCR, uh, uh, optical character recognition of the advertisements and provides a near transcription, although those are not always 100% uh, uh, accurate. Whenever possible, the quotation includes the names of enslaved people or at least the names by which they were known by their enslavers, recognizing that those were not necessarily the names that they gave themselves or that their family and friends gave them and that they were known uh, by you know, amongst themselves. Uh, but at the very least, we try to uh, honor and recognize the humanity of these enslaved people by acknowledging their names whenever they are known, because as you'll see 
many, many of these advertisements do not even uh, give, give the enslaved people in them the dignity of a name. This project also focuses on three of the four common elements of the advertisements that uh, David Waldstriker identified in that article that inspired uh, the project. Waldstriker was looking at trades or skills possessed by enslaved people, their linguistic ability or usage, and their ethnic or racial identity. He also looked a lot at clothing, although in the 280 characters that are available in a tweet, we don't have opportunity to go into depth into clothing. So instead, we focus on forged passes and enslaved people trying to pass as free men and women, which was another uh, component of, of Wald Stryker's original project as well. Now, in pursuing this project, I have several purposes that I'm trying to pursue. One of them is to demonstrate the ubiquity of advertisements about enslaved men, women, and children in early American newspapers. Every newspaper published in every region of the 13 British mainland North American colonies ran these advertisements. They were not unique to the Southern colonies. This project also seeks to demonstrate the complicity of printers and the early American press in perpetuating slavery, in facilitating the buying and selling of Africans and African Americans, and in encouraging the surveillance of black bodies, especially through those advertisements about enslaved people who liberated themselves. That such advertisements offering rewards uh, for the capture of those men and women who had liberated themselves encouraged even people who did not purport to be owners of enslaved people to participate in a culture of surveillance, to scrutinize black bodies, to scrutinize the clothing and comportment of the Africans and African Americans that they encountered. This was really an 18th century version of racial profiling taking place. Now, the complicity of the early American press in perpetuating slavery has garnered, garnered significant revenues for early American printers. We often think of the newspaper as being an agent of liberty in revolutionary America. We think about all of the uh, protests that were covered, the petitions that were published in the early American press, but those occurred side by side with these advertisements about enslaved people. And the revenues generated from advertisements about enslaved people helped to pay for the dissemination and production of early American newspapers that were advocates of liberty for white colonists. This project also seeks to offer two intertwining narratives for general audiences a narrative of exploitation, and another narrative of resistance and survival, as described by Ira Berlin in Coming to Terms with Slavery in 21st Century America, the first essay in the anthology, Slavery and Public History, The Tough Stuff of American Memory. As acts of protest, advertisements concerning enslaved men and women who liberated themselves are going to be central to this presentation. These advertisements about enslaved people are often considered to be the first narratives about enslaved people, even though they were not written by the enslaved people themselves. What we have to do with them is read against the grain. We have to recognize that the advertisements were written by the enslavers, but also recognize that they tell us important information about the experiences of the enslaved. These advertisements reveal that in the era of the American Revolution, and even before, enslaved people did not need the Declaration of Independence or other documents drafted by the founders to understand the value of freedom or to express their dignity as people rather than as commodities. 
and that these advertisements appeared almost as soon as the Boston newsletter began publication in 1704 as the very first newspaper uh, in continuous production in the colonies that became the United States, demonstrates that a revolution of sorts was in progress long before the period we now label as the era of the American Revolution, that enslaved men and people were liberating themselves decades before uh, the fighting took place that we now call the American Revolution. The final purpose is to educate the general public about the history of enslavement and resistance in early America by providing greater access to primary sources that they can then examine for themselves. So that being the case, I'd like to turn now to looking at more of these advertisements. And I'd like to start with this theme that I mentioned of advertisements about enslaved people being so important to generating revenues for newspapers. You can see on this page of the Georgia Gazette that every advertisement that concerns enslaved men, women, and children has been highlighted with a red rectangle. Keep in mind that your typical colonial and revolutionary American newspaper consisted of only four pages. Uh, two pages printed on each side of a broadsheet and then folded in half to create a four page issue. We can see a couple of more pages of the Georgia Gazette here, giving us a sense of just how many of these advertisements appeared uh, within a four page issue that oftentimes a significant amount of the content of any given newspaper would be advertisements about enslaved men, women, or children. And the, the advertisement in the blue rectangle, uh, that is a, uh, an advertisement seeking an overseer who would then supervise enslaved men, women, and children. So this, this has tentacles going out beyond just those advertisements that are explicitly about enslaved men, women, and children. Now, not every newspaper had such a high proportion portion of advertisements about enslaved men, women, and children. But as I mentioned previously, every newspaper published from New Hampshire down to Georgia included these advertisements. Every one of them uh, uh, ran advertisements uh, that fell into those four categories that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Turning to some of these individual advertisements themselves, I want to show you that this was indeed uh, a project that extended throughout the colonies. You're not, probably not surprised to see an advertisement from the Virginia Gazette, nor an advertisement from the South Carolina and American General Gazette published in Charleston, or the Georgia Gazette published in Savannah. But if we keep looking at other colonies, we see another advertisement from the New York Journal, an advertisement from the Pennsylvania Gazette, probably most famous because it was founded by Benjamin Franklin. Well, actually Franklin took it over shortly after it was founded, but that was the newspaper that made him famous. Uh, we see getting closer and closer to home for those of us who reside in New England, especially in Shrewsbury and the greater Worcester area, the, uh, an advertisement from the New London Gazette. Another one from the New Hampshire Gazette published in Portsmouth. The Newport Mercury uh, down in Rhode Island, we can see a cluster of advertisements in there, making the point that even if there weren't as many as appeared in some of the southern newspapers, there was still a critical mass uh, of, of these advertisements that appeared in northern newspapers. Another one from the Providence Gazette. And now we're going to see several from the Boston Evening Post, the Boston Chronicle, the Boston Gazette, the Boston Post Boy, the Boston Weekly Newsletter, the Massachusetts Gazette, this one published by Richard Draper, and the Massachusetts Gazette, this one published by Green and Russell. Two news newspapers with the same name operating at the same time, different publishers, but what they had in common with each other and with all of these other colonial newspapers, colonial and revolutionary newspapers, is that they all carried advertisements concerning enslaved men, women, 
and children. We've just been through half a dozen newspapers published in Boston in the late 1760s and early 1770s. Boston had more newspapers than any other city in British mainland North America at the time, and all of them carried these kinds of advertisements. It would be 1775 before Worcester had a newspaper of its own, so the Boston newspaper served as the local paper uh, for Worcester uh, during the late 1760s, late 1770s. And uh, advertisements concerning enslaved people that were relevant to Worcester would appear in the Boston newspapers. So turning our attention to uh, some of the demographic details that we can pull out here. These advertisements do tell us something about the origins of enslaved people. We can see in this advertisement from the Georgia Gazette mentions new Negro men. The adjective new there refers to enslaved people who had been transported across the Atlantic. Enslaved people who had survived the Middle Passage aboard slaving vessels. They had survived the atrocious conditions. They had survived what historians now call the tight packing of enslaved people aboard these vessels. They survived uh, and became enslaved people uh, after this involuntary migration across the Atlantic Ocean. These uh, advertisements also can tell us about other abuses that enslaved people endured. We see in this advertisement from the Newport Mercury that it acknowledges that the uh, enslaved man who had uh, liberated himself had two letters branded on one of his shoulders. And it's not uncommon to find these advertisements describing uh, branding and other uh, physical abuses uh, perpetrated upon black bodies. Going back to uh, the, the origins of many enslaved people, some of them simply denoted that they were from Africa. Others got more specific. Here we see one uh, about an enslaved man who was of the Coromantee country. Another one advertising uh, newly arrived enslaved people from Gambia. This one, uh, a workhouse advertisement for enslaved people who attempted to liberate themselves but had been captured again, uh, includes uh, uh, an enslaved man from Angola, an enslaved woman uh, of the Igbo country, and then another enslaved man uh, simply described as a new Negro does not indicate where uh, he, he was uh, from. Uh, another one for uh, an enslaved man of the Guinea country. And then we begin to see that not all enslaved people were transported across the Atlantic. What we, what we might have noticed with those that came across the Atlantic is that early Americans had a keen understanding of African geography. And different uh, regions, the enslaved people from them were, were valued for, for different reasons. Uh, that different skills, different levels of expertise uh, were often associated with enslaved men and women from specific locations. But we can see that some of these enslaved people, including two women, had been born in Jamaica and then transported to British mainland North America. We can see uh, others born in St. Kitts, another one uh, from Jamaica. And we can also see that enslaved people often experienced a high level of mobility, that this was not necessarily always a one-way trip across the Atlantic from Africa to British mainland North America, but oftentimes enslaved people traveled with their enslavers, uh, were uh, in, uh, like the example of, of Jack here, who had been in England, uh, oftentimes enslaved people worked aboard merchant vessels as well, and, and thus moved around the Atlantic world, crisscrossing from Europe to Africa to the Americas. We also see that many enslaved people 
had their origins right in the 13 colonies that eventually became the United States. We get these country-born enslaved people like Donis and Leeds in this advertisement, or uh, a, a man who is advertised in the Boston Weekly Newsletter who is described simply as born in this country. Uh, many of these advertisements will tell specific locations or at least the colonies, as in the case of a Virginia-born fellow named Dick and a Virginia-born woman named Grace. And we're going to circle back to Grace's advertisement a little bit later in the presentation. So the next thing, now that we've seen the origins and often the ethnicity of the uh, enslaved people in these advertisements, we can also discover the various uh, occupations that they pursued, the skills that they uh, possessed, the expertise that they possessed as well. Here we see an advertisement for an enslaved man who was described as very capable of waiting on a gentleman, taking care of a horse, or doing anything in a house that a servant man can do. Now, domestic service might not come as much of a surprise to us. I think that many people often associate enslaved people with agricultural labor, most commonly, but then also with domestic service. But as we explore these advertisements in greater detail, we see that some were blacksmiths. Uh, here's a cooper, a barrel maker, here we have uh, several enslaved people, uh, one of them described as a shoemaker, two others are excellent farmers. In this one, we have uh, several that are described as water Negroes, one of them an extraordinary good sail maker. These water Negroes would have been people who worked on sailing vessels. Keep in mind that in early America, rather than roads as an infrastructure, that goods would have been moved by water. So, uh, so skilled mariners would be very important. And as we see again with uh, an enslaved man who is described as an excellent boatman. This would include not only his skills as a mariner, but also his knowledge of the, the riverways and the coastline. Uh, here we see an advertisement that lists several together, choice millers, bakers, coopers, sawyers, watermen, running a plantation efficiently depended not only on the labor and expertise of agricultural workers, but also of a variety of other workers as well. So the exploitation here is twofold. It's not just for the labor that's being performed, but it's for the expertise and knowledge that is being involuntarily extracted from enslaved men and women. We see in this advertisement as well, and I like to show so many of them so that you get a sense that these are, are not rare, these are not, uh, these are not outliers, but are instead occurring repeatedly in these advertisements. This one we see uh, many enslaved people being advertised, among them boatmen equal to uh, most in the province or most in the colony, sawyers, a good cook, a jobbing carpenter, and a butcher. Here we see uh, enslaved shoemakers who had done all of John Matthews' business for nine years past. So Matthews was really benefiting from the labor and the skill of these enslaved shoemakers. We see here uh, four enslaved men who, are, uh, who were used to working at a mill, at a sawmill that's being offered for sale, or at least a third of that mill, some sort of partnership uh, situation. One of them is described as being able to do anything whatever about it. So for anybody who was looking to buy into this partnership, they might not need to know a whole lot about running the mill because they could also purchase an enslaved man who, who could provide that expertise and knowledge for them. In another advertisement, we see sawyers, shingle makers, tanier and courier, cooks, domestic servants, a good midwife, and agricultural laborers. Here we're going to turn to looking at some of the occupations that enslaved women uh, followed. Our good midwife would have been a very skilled and knowledgeable enslaved woman. We see in other advertisements, we get one where we have a good seamstress, 
uh, another sort of skilled worker who's also capable of waiting uh, on table and one who is a good washerwoman. We see in others that uh, the, uh, by, uh, promoting enslaved women for sale, they can wash and iron, they can do whatever is handy about the house. And here's another one who is capable of all kinds of housework, but has also lived on a farm and can provide, uh, provide in that way as well, can do a variety of tasks uh, on a farm. So uh, in addition to so many of these advertisements that tell us about the skills that enslaved people possess, we also see acts of resistance taking place. And we're going to focus on advertisements about enslaved people who liberated themselves in just a, a few moments. But first, I want to highlight uh, another sort of advertisement in which we see that a couple of enslaved people have been caught with two pieces of, uh, of fabric, a bundle of bed cords, another small bundle containing a, a, a book uh, that they had uh, they had basically stolen, they had uh, liberated these items for themselves in absence of receiving compensation for their labor. They participated in what historian Serena Zabin has referred to as the informal economy. We might think of it as, as a black market of, of sorts, but one way of exercising resistance was to engage in petty theft, breaking tools, playing sick in order not to have to engage in labor. Those were other means that enslaved people could engage in resistance. Perhaps the ultimate form of resistance, though, was liberating themselves by departing from those who purported to be their masters, running away from their enslavers. And the, uh, many of these enslaved men and women who made an attempt to liberate themselves did so uh, with quite clever means. We can see here an enslaved man named Billy had a forged pass that some good-natured person had written for him. And he had traveled uh, without much, much interruption as a result, and very possibly may have tried to prevail on some of his acquaintances to forge another pass uh, to assist him in prosecuting his intended scheme of getting from Virginia to South Carolina, where he expected to be free. So this indicates that it's not only enslaved uh, people who are, are trying to escape from bondage, but sometimes they had accomplices, uh, quite likely uh, sympathetic white accomplices in some cases, who would assist them with forged passes. They didn't always need these accomplices, however. We see here in the case of James that according to his enslaver, James can read and write and may possibly forge his own pass. In another advertisement, we see uh, a, a fellow named Cato, who was a cooper, a barrel maker by trade, and his wife Judy, who was a washerwoman, they outwitted their enslaver. They convinced their enslaver to give them a written pass uh, or a license that would allow them to go into town and work for a month. Oftentimes, enslavers found this to be a profitable venture. If they did not have enough work to keep their enslaved people occupied, they would allow them to do what was called hiring out. The enslaved people could go, they could find employers for a set amount of time. It could be a week, a month, several months, a year. And then at the end of that time, they were expected to return give all of the compensation back to their enslaver, and if the enslaver was feeling magnanimous, might give a small portion of that back to the enslaved person who had actually earned it. So Cato and Judy had apparently worked out this sort of relationship with their enslaver and had gone into town and their enslaver wasn't expecting to hear from them for a month or so, this basically gave them a month's worth of a head start. They hadn't been heard from since, and now their enslaver then was placing an advertisement trying to catch up with them as a result. We see here in this advertisement for Grace, 
who uh, attempted to liberate herself. And I told you before that we'd be circling back to have a look at her. We see what is probably one of her primary motivations for choosing that moment to attempt to liberate herself. The advertisement tells us that she appears to be young with child. So it doesn't take much to imagine, as I, I said before, that sometimes we need to read against the grain that even though the enslaver has written the advertisement, that it helps to tell us uh, something about the experiences of the enslaved people uh, and what their motivations would have been. I don't think it takes much to imagine that Grace likely did not want to see her child born into slavery, uh, did not want to see her, her child suffer the abuses and exploitation of enslavement, and, 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 and not be able to protect that child as well as she might be able to if she were able to liberate herself. And Grace certainly would have been aware that even being separated from her child was a very real possibility. Take into consideration this advertisement for a lottery. And this was a common way uh, in some colonies that people attempted to raise money when they fell into debt is that instead of having sales, they would instead sponsor lotteries in which people as well as things could be prizes. And so this scheme for a lottery includes several enslaved men, women, and children as the potential prizes in that lottery. And I've highlighted two for us to look at. We see a woman named Agnes who is offered as one of the prizes. And then Agnes's child named Rose, only 18 months old, is offered as another prize. And the probability of the same lottery participant winning both Agnes and Rose as a prize in this lottery was quite slim, that most likely Agnes and Rose would have been uh, separated. So it doesn't take much to imagine that an enslaved woman like Grace recognizing the possibility of being separated from her child would find that to be an important motivation to uh, attempt to make her escape, to liberate herself from her enslaver before the child arrived. We see here in another advertisement for Harry that he also likely had family considerations on his mind. Uh, he, is, is, he is described as having a free mulatto wife named, named Peg and that they had two children. Now the, the laws for enslavement specified that, uh, that children would follow the status of the mother so even though Harry was enslaved, since Peg was a free woman, uh, sh uh, their children would follow her status. Uh, their enslaver, uh, the appropriately named Levin Crapper, uh, suspected that they would endeavor to get together and uh, try to flee to New Jersey to, to get away from uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he also suspected that they had a pass that might help them uh, in their venture. Uh, I think that it's uh, important to note that this particular advertisement was placed on July 4th, 1768. Now in 1768, they wouldn't have known the uh, importance that July 4th, less than a decade later, would have for the American nation. But as I said at the beginning of this presentation, enslaved people didn't need a declaration of independence, they didn't need a constitution, they didn't need all of those other documents related to the American Revolution and the founding of the nation to know the value of freedom and to know the, the, the dignity of being treated as an actual human being. And so they engaged in these resistance efforts, they engaged in efforts to liberate themselves uh, long before the American Revolution uh, actually became uh, a, a, a fighting war, long before the Declaration of Independence was even contemplated by Jefferson and others serving in the Continental Congress. So I think that this would be a, a good place, um, considering how much time has elapsed,
groups, rather than uh, try to go in to how different constituencies have engaged with this. I can cover that during question and answer if some of you are, are interested. This might be a good time to, to offer a conclusion. And then my experience has been that there's usually uh, plenty of, of questions and I, I really enjoy uh, fielding those as well. So uh, by way of conclusion, I, I'd just like to say that early American newspapers perpetuated slavery and contributed to systemic racism in early America that has reverberations to, to, until today. But the advertisements about enslaved men, women, and children who liberated themselves also testify to a spirit of protest in 18th century America, a spirit of protest that continues today as the American Revolution remains unfinished, as we continue to strive for those ideals of liberty and justice for all, for those ideals of uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all Americans and not just some Americans, that the revolutionary era was very paradoxical in that it extended freedom and liberty to some, but not to others. And so that unfinished revolution is something that we as an American nation try to uh, continue to try to achieve today. So that being said, uh, I will try to end my screen sharing so that we can take some questions. Thank you, Carl. Um, what other media platforms were used for ads other than newspapers? Were there anything else? Oh, that's a great question. And my primary emphasis for research is on advertising in early America. And so most people assume that newspapers are the only media being distributed at that time. And that's not the case at, at all. Newspapers are certainly the, the most prominent. They are the most widely distributed. They are also the ones that have been preserved in greatest numbers. So they form a real backbone of this project, but in addition to newspapers, other sorts of advertisements about enslaved people would have been broadsides, what we call uh, posters today, handbills would have also uh, been used. Uh, by the time you get around to magazines being published, occasionally you would get uh, uh, advertisements about enslaved people on magazine wrappers. Advertisements didn't appear in the magazines themselves. And instead, they were separated from the magazines and, and on a wrapper on the outside. Uh, there's a variety of other forms of advertising that circulate, like trade cards and billheads and furniture labels. But those weren't used for uh, advertising enslaved people. Those were used for uh, consumer products. So, but there is a, a rich world of advertising in which several of the media, but not all of them, that were present in 18th century America uh, were used to either promote uh, the buying and selling of enslaved people or were uh, used in order to uh, alert the population to the fact that enslaved people had liberated themselves and to be on the lookout for them to try to capture them, claim rewards, return them to enslavement. Thank you. Um, any of the attendees, if you have questions, please feel free to write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask, ask Carl a question. Okay, so I see in the in the chat box, I, I'm gonna read the question just so that everybody uh, is aware of it and especially anybody who's uh, participating in Facebook Live and might not be able to see uh, the chat box as well. Uh, this is a fascinating collection of documents. Perhaps you already covered this. Sorry to say that I joined late, that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, everyone's welcome. Many were dated September 1768 and there appeared to be discrepancies between some dates in the advertisements and the date cited in the annotation. Uh, did this work actually begin in 1768? Okay, so uh, so these advertisements date uh, the, the, date back to 1704, 
that these sorts of advertisements were appearing as soon as the first permanent newspaper in the colonies was established. Uh, I have a collection of advertisements in this presentation from 1768, uh, just because I was, uh, they were convenient to, to grab all at one time. So that's why uh, they seem to be stuck into a particular moment. But I think you're very perceptive to realize that the date that the newspaper was published and the date on the advertisement itself didn't always match. And that's because uh, the advertisers would put a date at the end of the advertisement that was indica indicative of either the date that they wrote the copy for the advertisement or the date that they submitted the advertisement to the newspaper for publication. But then these advertisements would run for multiple weeks. Um, the typical uh, minimum length for a colonial American and revolutionary American advertisement, depending on the newspaper, was either three weeks or four weeks, that you paid one set fee to have the type set and then to run it for several weeks. Many of these advertisements ran for much longer than that, though. Some of them ran for months. I've tracked some of them in the course of working on this project that actually ran for six months, eight months. That tells you something about how invested enslavers were in recapturing enslaved people who had liberated themselves. If they're willing to be able to keep investing in paying for these advertisements in hopes that somebody who's out there engaging in the surveillance of Black people that they encounter is going to recognize an enslaved person who had liberated themselves. So, uh, so that's one of the reasons why the, um, the, the date for the newspaper in which a particular advertisement appeared doesn't necessarily correspond to the date in the advertisement itself. Uh, I had another, I actually had a question. Sorry, I don't have a, a viewer, but okay. uh, I was wondering, do you think that these advertisements had the same impact that social media does and the internet does for us today, where it, you talked a lot about um, enslavers in general, and I feel like that's probably a group of people that was already um, invested in it. But mm -hmm. I was just wondering if, if you thought that the advertisements really drew more people into, uh, into being a part of slavery, if that made sense. Yes, yes. And I, that, that is one of the, the purposes of the project is because uh, it, it is trying to make a point that these advertisements are inviting the entire uh, colonial and revolutionary population to participate in these acts of surveillance, to participate in the attempts to recapture you oftentimes will see advertisements that have been published in one newspaper get noted in another newspaper that uh, if, if an enslaved person who liberated themselves has been spotted, or especially if they had been captured, somebody will run an advertisement in say New York and say, this is relevant to that advertisement that appeared in a Pennsylvania newspaper. And th this also tells us something about the dissemination of newspapers, that they weren't just local to the city, the town, or the colony in which they were published, but that they actually circulated a lot more widely than that. So the, that you get people in distant colonies that are responding to advertisements that were originally published two or three colonies away uh, suggests that, that people are paying attention to these advertisements, that they do feel uh, that, that invited in to, to be part of, of this. D did that answer your question? I think so. I just, I think of the internet as being so pervasive and kind of creating its own kind of cult-like uh, followings uh, based on, you know, um, yeah, based on advertisements and other things that we see. And I was just wondering if you thought that it was as effective at that time. But I think if, with what you said about the colonies, um, between having thing, people respond between the colonies, it certainly sounds like it was as pervasive as it could be. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and these are, are so ubiquitous, the, these advertisements, that it'd be practically impossible to pick up a newspaper published in the era of the American Revolution and not see advertisements 
either offering enslaved people for sale or documenting enslaved people who had liberated themselves. I, I see there's some other uh, questions and, and comments in, in the chat box. Uh, one, one says, what was the reaction of churches and church leaders? Also wondering if the for sale posts were also made at places where people gathered, including public houses, meeting houses, et cetera. So um, I, I don't have a lot to, to say about churches and church leaders, except that um, uh, many of, of them were also complicit in the, uh, in the slave trade and in the perpetuation of slavery, although there were notable counterexamples. The Quakers were, were, were well known in the 18th century for being among the first proto-abolitionists, right? And so, uh, they they advocated against slavery, uh, at least many of them did. And so when people try and make an argument that enslavers in the 18th century were just products of their time, uh, that's not completely accurate. It's not the best justification because there were plenty of people, uh, plenty of Quakers that did object to slavery and trying to, uh, to, to put this in terms of, well, being products of their time, well, who are you considering the people that you're going to consult when you're talking about being products of their time? Because these enslaved people, especially the ones who were liberating themselves, they certainly understood that this was, uh, this, that enslavement was, uh, was, was uh, not acceptable. Uh, the part of the question about um, if the, the for sale posts were made at places where people gathered, including public houses, meeting houses, that sort of thing. Many of the advertisements uh, in the newspapers themselves would direct people to go to auctions or vendues or sales that were held in taverns or at auction houses. Uh, or at coffee houses, so, so gathering places where many people got together. And the broadsides or the posters that I mentioned before, those certainly would have been posted up around towns in a variety of places, but most especially in those popular gathering places like the taverns, the coffee houses, those sorts of places. I see another question is asking about how these advertisements could be used for genealogical research. And I'll have to confess that uh, I don't have a very good answer for that. Genealogy is not one of my areas of expertise. Um, genealogy is a very specific skill set and uh, I have tremendous respect for, for, for genealogists, but it is not, um, it is not a metho methodology that I have developed myself. So I would be willing, uh, I would be um, very excited to hear from genealogists if they have ideas about how these could be used. Occasionally I hear via the website from, from genealogists who have discovered somebody in their family tree uh, who is mentioned in an advertisement that I've republished. Uh, oftentimes they're not um, advertisements about enslaved people because the website also has a, a, another project that's about um, advertisements for consumer goods. Uh, and so oftentimes people find shopkeepers and merchants that they were uh, related to. Um, but they don't really, they, I, I don't know exactly how they're using this information or, or um, how they're using it to further expand on uh, their own genealogical research. Uh, there's another question about whether there's information on what public reaction was or were there ads in protest of these ads or newspapers who refused to carry such advertising. It's really interesting. There was an article that came out in Early American Studies last July. So it's a really new article uh, in which Jordan Taylor was looking at the, the, the printing of these uh, advertisements. And he very methodically went through newspapers published in 18th century America and could not discover any that refused to publish these advertisements. Many of them in their mastheads made big pronouncements about being agents of liberty, that sort of thing, but still did not find their way to not publishing these sorts of 
of, of, of advertisements. And uh, some of the work that I do on the uh, website is that I will often uh, post uh, examples of advertisements about enslaved people that are appearing right next to advertisements for books about, uh, about political philosophy that is about liberty, books about political philosophy that's being used to justify the American Revolution. Or oftentimes these advertisements will run right next to news articles about say, the Boston Massacre or other important events uh, related to the American Revolution. So you've got this real juxtaposition of advertisements about slavery that are next to news articles and editorials that are about freedom population. Uh, I see another, uh, another question is asking about about how students assist with um, this research and what the response to this experience is. So as I mentioned uh, previously, I do incorporate this into several courses that I teach. And the basic, uh, the basic uh, protocol that I have for students is each of them is uh, responsible for a week in the 1760s or now we've moved on to the 1770s that students are responsible for creating their own miniature archive of digitized 18th century newspapers they have to identify all of the newspapers published during their particular week uh, that have been digitized they have to download those create their own archive and then once they have their archive they go through those newspapers page by page and identify each one of the advertisements that mentions enslaved men, women, and children. And then I go through it again for quality control just to make sure that none of them got missed. And uh, I remediate them, I crop the, all of the images and then supply the images back to the students who are responsible for writing a tweet about each one of those advertisements. As we saw when these are redistributed via Twitter, each one of them has the tagline, a quotation, the citation, uh, all of those sorts of things. So the students are responsible for choosing what goes into the quotation. So they have to pay special attention to uh, the, the actual content of the advertisement. They can't just identify, hey, this mentions an enslaved person. They have to dive in more deeply to see, well, what's really significant in this advertisement? And so they're, they're doing a, a significant amount of work with the, the the production, the research and the production of these these advertisements, and uh, I find that students uh, approach this assignment initially with some anxiety because it's not the sort of assignment that they're uh, accustomed to doing. But once they've gone through the workshops, once we've done our tutorials in class, they become familiar with the digital databases, they become familiar with 18th century pr printed materials, that they begin to feel a real sense of ownership and authority because they've been entrusted with working on this project that is disseminated to uh, broad audiences out there. And so this, this gives them a, a sense of, of uh, accomplishment and achievement. And it also is what I like to think of as being an authentic assignment that so many assignments that college students do uh, have an audience of one the professor, right? And for this assignment, students really get to see that I'm not the only audience for this. And so they get invested in uh, being able to, to participate in the production and distribution of these. And especially they, they like to track the uh, engagement that this takes place on Twitter uh, when people respond to it, when people retweet, when people ask questions, when people make comments. So they really feel like they are part of a community of, of scholars when other people are engaging with them rather than it being just the professor who's giving them some sort of uh, feedback on the project. So I think, I think that I've, mm -hmm. I've hit all of the uh, questions that were over in the, the chat. I'll scroll through real quick just to make sure. I think I got all of them.
Well, um, it's just past eight o'clock. So thank you very much, Professor Keyes. And thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. Um, the third presentation in our series of talks on social justice will be on December 9th at 7 p.m. Um, Cynthia Pika Smith, Associate Professor of Human Services and Rehabilitation Services at Assumption University, will talk uh, on the topic of the importance of interracial friendships. So thank you all very much, and thank you again, uh, Professor. Thank you, everyone.